Welcome to the second day of the Spatial Data Science Symposium. My name is Kitty Courier, and we're here for the second paper session of the day. And we've got three paper presenters uh, today that I'll introduce in just a moment. Each of them are gonna give their paper presentation and we'll have approximately 15 minutes each. And during each presentation, I would encourage everyone to type their questions into the Q&A tab at the right side of your screen. And please, when you do that, include the name of the presenter because we'll take all the questions during the last <coughs> minutes of the session. And um, it can be tricky to sometimes sort out which question goes to which presenter. So um, I'd like to introduce our presenters today, Killian Barragan, Tyler Hoffman, and James Williams. And so we'll begin in that order. And so I'd like to invite Killian to go ahead and share your screen and uh, let's begin your presentation. Great. We see Great. your screen. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Killian. I'm a, a PhD student at the University of Liverpool. Uh, so I'll be presenting our short paper called uh, Geoparsing Comments from Reddit to Extract Mental Place Connectivity Within the United Kingdom. Uh, so first of all, what is mental place connectivity? So the idea is traditional place connectivities are usually explored through true population movement. And these movements have both a temporal and spatial dimension. So often people will use things like uh, transport movement records or um, mobile phone data through things like SafeGraph. So what we're interested in looking at is more the idea of this persistent connectivity that, exi that exists between two distinct locations. Um, and because this is a persistent connection, there's no sort of uh, temporal or spatial limitation. And it instead reflects this idea of mental maps that people uh, often have um, based on their sort of experience of geographies. Uh, so how can we quantify this idea of mental place connectivity? Um, so we're most interested in, in looking at using text data for this. And the idea is text data captures uh, this experiential geographic knowledge that individuals often have. Um, and on top of this, text is also passively contributed uh, by a large number of individuals and already exists in a large volume online. Um, so for example, we don't necessarily need to construct a large scale study because the data already exists. Um, on top of this, importantly, text also includes geographic information and that's primarily through place names themselves. Uh, so in terms of methods for quantifying this, uh, what we were interested in looking at is how we could construct this index of mental place connectivity. And the idea is this kind of index should be uh, comparable between different connections, meaning, uh, for example, larger cities shouldn't just automatically be more connected. Uh, and on top of this, the connections should be derived from an individual level. Um, so, so, for example, they shouldn't just be built from general web pages where uh, usually there's one or two authors, basically. So uh, this is just an overview of some of the outputs of this work. So for the first stage of our um, method, we create our own custom built geoparsing pipeline. And we use this to extract all of the place names from our Reddit comments uh, and then ground them to geographic coordinates when possible. So for the first stage of this model pipeline, uh, we built our own name density recognition model. Um, and I'll talk about this more, but it's available uh, for anyone to use on this uh, Hugging Face Model Hub. Uh, so once we'd extracted place names, we then created this index of place connectivity. Uh, and we did this between over 50,000 unique locations in the UK. And um, these connections are available to view as an interactive map of, uh, online. Uh, so once we'd established connections, we wanted to evaluate how the strength of connectivity vary based on uh, a comparison between the indices of multiple deprivation, which is a UK centered data set um, that evaluates material deprivation uh, alongside sentiment, which ex we extract from the comments themselves. And finally, there's also this uh, collection of place names that we extracted from Reddit comments um, that also includes some quite interesting meta information uh, that we'd quite like to make available as well. So this is just an overview of the name density recognition model that we built. So the idea is this model, uh, unlike a general name density recognition method, um, had the goal of just identifying place names from text um, and also was trained to be more appropriate for social media data. So generally these, these pre-built models tend to perform a little uh, poorly when not applied to more structured data sets. Um, so it's available on this model hub and there's a QR code there that anyone can look at, but it'd probably be easier to, to look at the slides later on and, and scan it uh, separately. 
But essentially here on the left, we have a demonstration of how you implement this model in Python. Um, and essentially all you need is this transformers library where um, you can input what they've called a pipeline, uh, reference the model uh, repository, and then um, the generator, essentially, you can input any text and get outputs uh, that are essentially locations that is identified. Uh, so next, this is just an overview of the data we use. So the primary data source we used is, is comments from Reddit. So we extracted uh, just over 8 million comments from uh, Reddit, <clears throat> which were submitted by around 500,000 unique users. And for these comments, we specifically just targeted UK-related subreddits. Um, so Reddit split into these subforums, which are called subreddits, which have uh, specific topics of discussion. And many of these relate to, um, say, locations across the UK. Uh, so for the model training for the named entity recognition stage, we use a data set that already exists called uh, WNUT17. And this is just a annotated collection of text from uh, these four different uh, social media websites. Um, and while it annotates a variety of entities, we just include locational entities to train a model specifically just for place name identification. Um, and our Reddit comments as well, we also annotate uh, around 500 with just place names. Um, and we use this to evaluate the performance of our NER model, as well as um, we retrain the model after evaluating performance to include this data uh, when we use it for inference to just improve performance. <clears throat> uh, so why, why do we use Reddit specifically to generate these mental connections? Uh, so one of the main benefits of Reddit um, is because it's split into subforums, we were able to specifically target subreddits that um, talk about uh, specific locations specifically in the UK. And what this means is there's a, there's a lot of just discussion generated about places. Uh, so for example, in the Liverpool subreddit, people often post threads which uh, ask for uh, opinions about where to visit and things like that. So there's lots of place names being mentioned in a higher proportion than say general uh, Reddit text. On top of this, Reddit is also, uh, comments are generally longer than, on, on a, than tweets on something like Twitter where there's a limited number of characters. And from my uh, point of view, the, the written style is more consistent and more structured, meaning uh, people are less likely to use abbreviations on Reddit or uh, misspell words and use proper punctuation, which is essentially just all things that make uh, the model finds easier to parse. And finally, probably most importantly, Reddit actually has quite an accessible API, which is completely open to use. And uh, for extracting large volumes like we did, um, there's also a push shift archive, which is just uh, a collection of all comments that have ever been posted, which you can easily uh, pass as well. You can easily use the API to extract from as well. Um, so this is just an overview of the methods. So as I said, we first built this uh, custom geoparsing pipeline to identify all these place names from every comment in our collection of comments, uh, and then ground them to geographic locations. So these, these geoparsing pipelines are generally split into two broad stages. Um, so for our first stage, in order to identify place names, we use an NER model. Um, and for this, we use a fine-tuned transformer. And transformers are just um, a, sort, a kind of neural network architecture which generally just perform particularly well on natural language processing tasks. Um, and one of the main reasons is because they're pre-trained on large amounts of text. And in order to be task-specific for social media data, uh, we use a, twit, a, a, a transformer that was trained using tweets. Uh, and then for uh, fine-tuning this model, we then use the Reddit and the WNET data, like I mentioned before. Um, so the second stage of geoparsing is generally called um, toponym disambiguation. Um, and the reason dis disambiguation is required is because often uh, in, say, a gazetteer, you'll have place names <clears throat> that are, uh, appear multiple times but with different coordinates because they exist in different locations. Um, and instead of using, say, a general gazetteer like geonames, we decided to use uh, OS open names and the gazetteer of British place names. And what this meant was um, we were able to include things like individual streets and points of interest like parks, which we found uh, specifically for the UK, which we found weren't often uh, appearing in, in the uh, Geonames Gazetteer. And finally, we also extracted sentiment with respect to each place name. So any comment that had a place name, uh, we ran a, a pre-built sentiment model on to find the, uh, the uh, predicted sentiment of the sentence. So once we'd extracted all place names, we found that around 27% of all comments contained at least one place name. Um, and this is quite high proportionally given, and, and it really reflects our decision on choosing just to uh, use subreddits dedicated to the UK. Um, so in total, we found 4.8 million place names in all these comments. 
so once we'd extracted place names, we then created this index of mental place connectivity. And the way this index is created is based on um, co-occurring locations that appear in each user's collection of comments. So instead of using uh, the context of a, co a single comment as a, as a context, we use a co total collection of users' comments. And doing this, we found those 15 million total unique connections. Uh, so the equation at the bottom just gives an overview of how this PCI, how the, how the connectivity index is, is calculated. And essentially what we have is uh, for places I and J, SIJ is just the total number of users that mention both the places I and J in their collection of comments. And in order to normalize this value, we just divide by the square root of SI, which the users that mention place I, and SJ for the users that mention place J. And essentially what this gives for each of these 15 million connections, we have a value from uh, one, which is like the total, uh, the highest possible sort of mental connectivity value you can have, um, all the way down to near zero, where um, there's essentially nearly no connectivity between these two places. <clears throat> so um, in terms of results, so we first evaluate the performance of our named anti-recognition model. And we find that the, the um, when trained on just WNUT data, it achieves an F score of 0 0.93 when evaluated on our uh, annotated collection of Reddit comments. And this is kind of interesting given it's a much higher performance than you'd expect um, based on the reported test scores of the WNET data. I think what this primarily reflects is the um, improved performance of um, the model on, on, on data that's more well structured uh, on Reddit compared to say YouTube and Twitter. Um, so our sentiment model achieves an F score of 0 0.76 on, our, on some annotated comments as well. <clears throat> and while this is lower, it's, it's it's in line with the expected scores of this model. I think just generally um, sentiment model performance is a little more tricky. Um, so in terms of toponym disambiguation, we found we didn't directly assess performance, but we found that around 63% of all place names were able to be attributed with coordinates, um, which is higher than the expected we'd use like a, a, a geo names particularly, which wouldn't have included all our um, street names, for example. So in total, we found around 57 thousand uh, locations that were unique. Um, and of course, many of these have shared names that were disambiguated. So on the figure on the right just shows the an overview of where places were found. Um, I think most interestingly, despite this just being social media data, there are um, high instances of play, people talking about quite remote locations, which was surprising to me when we, we looked at it. Um, so this is just an overview of how um, PCI values relate to the distance between two locations, um, sentiment and the IMD scores. So what we find is that PCI values do appear to experience some sort of distance decay effect. <clears throat> and so PCI values that are higher are generally for locations that are more nearby, which is what you would expect in a general geographic data set. Um, sentiment appears to have some sort of correlation with PCI. Um, which suggests that places with more negative sentiment do tend to have lower PCI values. Um, but what's interesting is the IMD score correlation is much lower. And this potentially suggests that um, people's mental perceptions of places that we identify through sentiment are more likely influential on the levels of connectivity compared to this uh, deprivation levels. Um, so I'll this is now basically I'll talk about how we visualize these connections um, and this is the uh, taken from our interactive figure. Uh, so what we first did was aggregate to local authority districts. And this meant that instead of looking at, say, connections between specific streets and things like that, we combine them uh, together, which gives us a more sort of regional focus, which is easier to visualize and analyze like this. And so what we see on this figure is um, places like London, there's strong interconnectivity with London and surrounding suburbs. Um, but London in particular is unusual in that it does have still quite strong connections uh, with other major cities across the UK, uh, despite there being quite a long distance between them. So here it's cut off, but Scotland's quite well connected with London, uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow, I mean. Um, and interestingly as well, Wales has uh, strong interconnectivity with itself, uh, despite it being quite a large distance, but also um, very little connectivity with the rest of the UK. Um, so we also zoom in and look at Liverpool and Manchester in particular, what we find is that there is high interconnectivity around surrounding these cities, but also a direct connection between Liverpool and Manchester. But what's most interesting about this direct connection is that um, the intermediate local authorities between these two cities have no connectivity, which is shown by these um, grey circles without any connections. 
Um, and I believe this is different to what you'd expect with, say, a, a transport mobility data set, where these are likely commuter towns for the two cities as well. <clears throat> and so this slide just covers Scotland in particular. And, and so Scotland's quite different to the rest of the UK in that it has very strong connectivity uh, between each of its local authorities. And what we actually find is the highest level of connectivity in the whole data set is between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, so there's probably more to look into about why this has happened, but there was a good point made one, by one of the reviewers, which we thought we'd address and we, we had a look at it. So essentially, uh, because some of these Scottish remote areas in Scotland have place names that are uh, derived from Gaelic, they're unlikely to be ambiguous, meaning they don't really appear in any other location. And we actually looked at this. So we found that Highland Local Authority, only 27% of place names are ambiguous, whereas in Manchester, around 40% of these place names are ambiguous. And so what this really reflects is that the performance, particularly in the disambiguation stage of our pipeline, likely is higher in, in Scotland, where there's um, fewer place names to get mixed up with, basically. I thought it was interesting to consider. Um, so this is just conclusion. In, so basically, the idea behind this paper is that we can extract this kind of geographic information from Reddit, despite there actually not being any specific geographic information, like you would have geotags with something like Twitter. Um, there's also this uh, distance decay that's still apparent when we're looking at mental connectivity, um, which suggests that even though we're just deriving these connections from people's comments, um, there still is this uh, large geographic component with it. Um, so finally, in, in terms of this data set, I actually think it's a very interesting data set and there's a lot more that could be done with it. So in particular, sentiment could be viewed at, from different uh, perspectives, for example. So the figure on the right wasn't included in the paper, but it gives you an overview of how we can sort of rank average sentiment of cities and even look at how sentiment differs based on the perspective of, of certain authors. Um, on top of this, it'd be interesting to look at how um, we could potentially cluster place names uh, based on their semantic context or even look at deriving regions based on um, the locations that I mentioned in our data set. So uh, creating urban areas of interest or even semantic regions, which I think would be interesting. Um, so this is just some additional work that we've done, but I believe I've probably not got too much longer, but essentially we've also looked at using gravity models to frame our analysis as well. And an alternative way of viewing these uh, connections, although it's quite hard to see on this um, slide. Um, but I won't talk too much about that. But anyway, thank you very much for listening. Um, there's an interactive map that you can scan the QR code if you want to have a look as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Killian, for that presentation um, and for the QR code. I'd like to remind everyone that you can download the papers that are being presented today. And in a moment, I'll paste that link in the chat. Um, so I'd like to now introduce our next presenter, Tyler. Uh, who's coming to us from Arizona, and it's uh, almost 3 a.m. for him. So thank you very much for, for presenting uh, from the middle of your night. And, <laughs> and I'm happy to be here. Tyler, I think go ahead and share your screen, and I'll confirm when we see it. Give it a sec. All right. Do you see it? Yep. Yes, I see it. Please begin. Wonderful. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Tyler Hoffman. Uh, I'm coming to you live from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a PhD student here at Arizona State University. Uh, and this work is um, a, a vision paper that my advisor and I have written together about sort of broad scale uh, forward looking ideas in spatial causal inference. So to begin, I, I want to motivate this problem. Um, we, we have in geography this pattern process approach. We talk about this all the time. Uh, this is really how we frame most of our spatial analytical questions, right? We observe a spatial pattern, we analyze the structure of the associations between variables within that pattern, and then we use those to make inferences about the processes that may have given rise to the pattern. But there are often a lot of different processes that could have given rise to the observed pattern. Here, P1 through P7 are all potential processes that may lead to the pattern that is uh, displayed here. And this is the problem of equifinality. All these processes may be associated with the pattern, but we can't a priori know which process is causing it because the knowledge of these associations alone is not enough. In fact, association is, in some sense, the simplest kind of question you could ask about a relationship. Uh, purely, it's, it's asking, are X and Y correlated, right? Are, how does seeing 
x change my belief in y, given that it's observed here. And the z, uh, this z is get, going to be carried forward through the next couple of equations. Uh, it indicates other variables that are also observed um, in, in whatever we're talking about here, this probability statement. Um, but we can take step, things a step further by asking, how likely is it that y happens if I fix x? And this is a really crucial difference. Here, we're no longer observing x. We're now actively getting involved in the situation, and we're saying, I'm going to prescribe that x be a value, and then watch what happens to y when that is the case, rather than simply seeing, oh, x is this value, what, have, what is y? Um, yeah, what, what is y as well? So an example of this might be, will the size of a herd of deer increase if we protect a new area? Uh, and again, this is an intervention. This is us as researchers actively getting involved and protecting that area. And, um, but in geography, these sorts of interventions are hard to do. We can't control complex geographical systems or do these experiments in the real world. It, it might be infeasible, it might be unethical. So this leads to this third step on the ladder, which is the counterfactual. Given observed data, did one variable cause another? And this is a question about alternate worlds, different things that might have happened, and it's really what leads us to cause. So currently, conventional spatial uh, statistical techniques and non-spatial statistical techniques uh, can get us associations. Uh, that's, that's conditional inference. That's what everyone thinks about when you uh, do a linear regression or do statistical, any sort of statistical learning technique. Um, but by synthesizing interventions and associations, we can pose and investigate questions about what would have happened if the world was different. And this is what the field of causal inference uh, does. It, it formulates these counterfactuals and allows uh, statisticians to do inference on the counterfactuals. And to do this in space, we'll need to do two things. We need to first further develop theories of spatial causal inference, and second, reorganize our computational and statistical tools in order to enable them, uh, in order to enable those theories that we develop in, in software. But this is, I want to first emphasize, this is a really big opportunity. The, the causal inference uh, literature and community is, is robust and thriving. There is, there are, there's a lot of current work happening in causal inference, uh, in spatial causal inference, and uh, it, this is, this goes both ways, right? So the, the theory of causal inference is incomplete without a treatment of space because as geographers, I, I don't even need to be saying this, but things happen in space and it's, uh, it's where these problems are located and, and influences how we think about things. Um, and in the reverse, uh, we, we slow down when we don't take a causal approach, when we aren't able to analyze the processes or the, the alternate realities that uh, those processes ind may induce, we, are, we have a harder time uh, developing the theories that we need to develop. Um, so both fields benefit from this sort of a melding. But parallel to spatial statistics, there are places where space poses problems in the existing theory of causality. So I, I want to highlight a few of these um, uh, in the next bit. So the first one is spatial confounding. Um, if there are confounding variables or outcome variables that uh, follow spatial spatially varying distributions, then this may cause bias in or create bias in the causal effect estimates. So this may be due to minute, unquantifiable, or highly local qualities of places uh, that are just simply not modelable. Uh, this may be due to observable and modelable uh, information that we simply have not thought of as a confounder previously. And these sorts of things need to be controlled in order to uh, isolate the effect of an intervention on an outcome. And it, it dovetails from Anselm's principle of spatial heterogeneity. If places are different, then their responses to a treatment may be different. So here, uh, despite X1 and X2 being the same in region A and region B, the response varies, uh, potentially because of unquantifiable spatial heterogeneity. It could also be due to non-spatial error, uh, but again, in this scenario, we, we don't a priori know, and so we need some, some sort of way to uh, divide these up and analyze that. Uh, another issue is spatial interference. So if a treatment at one location affects the outcomes at others, then we can no longer isolate the effects of that treatment. So the example here is um, if pedestrians, or if we have um, a lot of city blocks, excuse me, 
We have a lot of city blocks and we're an urban planner concerned with pedestrian mortality. And our intervention is to add crosswalks. People are getting hit by cars too much. We're, we're interested in do crosswalks lower pedestrian mortality? But if we treat the, the T squares are treated, the U squares are untreated. If we treat a uh, crosswalk, if we treat certain city blocks next to untreated city blocks, the pedestrian mortality rates in those untreated city blocks may go down, in fact, because pedestrians are gravitating towards the treated blocks that have those crosswalks instead of going in the untreated blocks. So we'll get this spurious relationship in the untreated blocks where all of a sudden uh, it actually turns out that not having crosswalks lowers pedestrian mortality. And so that sort of an interference is really dangerous when you're doing these sorts of modeling problems because because of Tobler's law. Uh, nearby things tend to be related, and that is confounding our ability to uh, to analyze and isolate this causal relationship. So interventions like this have these spillover effects on neighboring units, which, which cause interference. So um, in GI science, we have uh, sort of our object-oriented origins of this, uh, of this, of our field, uh, mean that we're really well equipped to studying the patterns. But off, what we really need to understand is the process, the things that give rise to these patterns, which is, in, is one and the same with the understanding of counterfactuals, these alternative processes and explanations that give rise to the pattern. So I, I want it, this is sort of the big point of this vision paper, which is that the understanding of process is equivalent to the understanding of counterfactuals, and only by doing one can we do the other. Uh, so to, that was all about the theory. Now about the computational side, um, there are ways to do this. And in fact, as I alluded to earlier, there are a lot of techniques out there at our disposal already. There's active work on spatial causal inference. Our pitch is that now is the time to really devote a lot of energy as a field to uh, to making this happen and to broadening and creating widespread, uh, uh, you know, interest in this sort of a, in, in this, these sort of modeling techniques. There's at least three widely accepted frameworks for conceptualizing causal inference and many, many more ways to implement it. Um, directed acyclic graphs are a nice way to lay out what variables, the relationships between variables that a modeler thinks may exist. Uh, probabilistic programming languages are ways to encode these relationships and do inference on random variables. Causal machine learning is a way to, an often non-parametric way to analyze relationships between variables and isolate causal effects without even, without caring about the interpretation of those models. It's, it's sort of counterintuitive, but it turns out you actually don't need that in order to isolate uh, the causal effects you would prefer to have a really good fit. So there's, you know, these, these all have their own like, very long uh, literatures associated with them. And the, the spatial side is, is only sort of starting to come into its own. So our vision is to, to bring this to the forefront of ge spatial data science and geography as a whole, to implement these extensions to these techniques that address the challenges posed by space. And I'm sure there are more challenges that are posed by space. These, the confounding and inference problems are uh, simply the most evident ones. But as, as we go through and uh, implement these problems and, and develop the theories, uh, there will likely be more issues that crop up that will require a uh, more concerted effort by geographers to, to solve. So to conclude, uh, equifinality really confounds our ability to infer from data. Uh, understanding causality and process has long been a goal of, of research in geography and GI science. And because we there are so many different possible processes that could give rise to a pattern, but we really have a hard time figuring out which one is the one that's causing it. But despite a uh, consensus about needing to understand these intricacies of, of process, the implementation of methods that can study it has remained limited within our field. So we need to we need to bring out uh, we need, to, we need to bring out more spatial causal methods to the fore. That's partly because causal inference is really young, and it was developed around the same time as, as major advances were made in spatial statistics and GI science. Uh, there were also computational limitations for a long part of that history, and it's partly because we lack this formal theory to express how space fits into cause and vice versa. So the time is right to begin down this path on so we can start reframing our inquiries from 
what's happening and where is it happening to how is this happening and what drives it. And that's all I've got. All right, thank you very much, Tyler. Appreciate that talk with very clear examples to, to make it understandable to a wide audience. And so for our third speaker, James, I'd invite you to share your screen and I'll confirm when we see it. Yep, we see your presentation. Thank you. That's great. Um, so yeah, so um, I guess once again, this is another sort of vision paper. Um, so we're looking at sort of a more specific sort of contextual approach. Uh, so it's looking at context for leisure walking routes and our vision is for sort of a spatial palatial approach to, to generating this context or to adding this context to leisure walking routes. Um, so I'm currently a PhD student at the Horizon Center of Doctoral Training at the and the Nottingham Geospatial Institute. So I'm doing a multidisciplinary uh, PhD. Um, so we're sort of looking at this from a couple of different angles. We've got sort of that geospatial side. We've also got the sort of geography and then we've got the sort of HCI um, side of computer science as well. Um, so if you just put me while I choose the slide. Um, so yeah, so for a bit of context, um, so we're interested in how user engagement with places of interest can improve the personalization of leisure walking experiences. Um, so we do use places of interest as a term different from that of points of interest, um, which we will describe in a later slide. Um, and this work presents a vision as to how sort of context for this leisure walking routes can be curated. Um, sort of how spatial and placial methods and data can be used to support sort of the extrapolation of some user studies that we've been conducting and how we can add you know, more data um, to existing sources. So the objectives and the purpose. So yeah, so we were looking to propose a vision as to how this context can be um, sort of added. Um, and that's sort of two key questions. So how can sort of spatial data science methods uh, support the curation of characteristics for sort of walking places of interest? So we, we've formed around this idea of places of interest being related to walks and being sort of fuzzy um, sort of locations along the walks. And also what existing data sets can be used to support the palatial approach. Um, so there's not too many, uh, too much work on sort of, um, sort of palatial data sets and uh, there's not too many sources uh, due to the sort of fuzzy and uh, I guess context specific um, requirements of um, sort of palatial information. And then we're looking to sort of consider methods for sort of extrapolating this context. And um, overall, we're looking to design a framework for recommending leisure walking routes. Um, think sort of a mobile application and um, that's the that's the overall focus of the sort of PhD and the study. So to give a bit of background, so from background literature, we've got sort of um, existing literature that considers methods such as points of interest. Um, this can also be sort of Flickr data. You occasionally see things on sort of street view imagery as well. Uh, and these often focus on sort of check-in histories or the most popular um, sort of routes. So very useful in the context of sort of tourism guides and you know introducing people to a new area. But actually, if you sort of live in an area and you're just looking for an interesting leisure walk, or you go to an area quite often and you're looking to see maybe there's a there's a better leisure walk, it's not too helpful um, because, you know, um, in sort of suburban and rural areas, there's a lot less data that exists, um, if any, on a lot of these places, um, sort of locations. So there's also that problem with POIs, which is, you know, there's very few changes that are represented and um, there's a lack of sort of related dynamic context um, being represented within these data sets. So often uh, at times you won't get any sort of temporal information. And if you do, you'll simply get any sort of the opening times and maybe how busy it is at most. Um, so POIs are for this purpose often very static and not sort of represent representative of the rich detail that can occur. So I always use the example of sort of a cafe um, along a walking route it might have sort of a perfect time for people to go in there. Um, and that's not really represented in a POI data set, um, specifically if they, you know, only open certain hours and maybe it's a sort of family run business and has quite random. And route recommenders, um, they often relate to sort of, sort of direct city routes or, uh, or urban pedestrian routes. Um, James, I'm sorry at. to interrupt you, but uh, okay, now we're back. We just lost your screen share for a moment, but please go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, so I guess I'll just cover that part again. So um, yeah, they're, they're, they're not representative of sort of that richer detail. So POIs are used in route recommenders. Um, so these often relate to sort of direct routes, which, you know, it's a route across the city, but maybe it takes a few detours to make it a slightly nicer walk or urban pedestrian routes, which covers the same thing. 
Um, so leisure walking as, a, as sort of an activity uh, might require a more personal experience to be represented. And um, once again, coming to this sort of experiential aspect of um, sort of places of interest along a walk. So uh, previously, um, someone's done a survey on the sort of quality aware route navigation for pedestrians, and they proposed this sort of sweep taxonomy. Um, so it's got sort of the five different categories. And we've got safety, which relates to sort of crime free, accident free routes. Um, so making sort of easier routes and safer routes for the users. Then you've got well-being, um, which is sort of exercise for keeping fit and also avoiding harm. Once again, link into that safety aspect. Then there's effort, so physical effort. So some people simply walk just for exercise, um, whereas you know other people might just walk to, to have for sort of the experience, the cognitive experience. Once again, that also still links to that sort of avoiding harm and safety aspect, which sort of follows through a lot of these um, sort of data quality options. We've then got exploration, which is what, what a lot of um, work sort of focuses on. So we've got sort of venues, so POIs, um, cafes, pubs along a route, things like that. And we also have sort of nice views along a path, which people have done um, using sort of geograph and um, street view imagery previously. Um, there's a couple of problems that approach that we'll cover in a, in a later slide. And uh, finally, we also have pleasure, so sort of pleasant, scenic and natural routes. Um, think sort of scenic or not um, in the sort of modern era. So we've previously done a, um, a user study on um, a survey of sort of leisure walking behaviours. Um, so we asked behavioural based questions um, to find out what people sort of thought leisure walking was, because there wasn't much of a sort of a determination of what people thought leisure walking was and how it can be used. Um, so participants uh, largely enjoyed uh, walking for getting outside. So this is things sort of um, like, you know, uh, fresh air, um, open spaces and sort of visiting nature. There's also well-being, once again, link into that um, previous taxonomy and um, exploration, um, link into sort of the POI based uh, research areas. Uh, there's also sort of asked people about their rationale for walking. So um, sort of what was their purpose? So a lot of people mentioned sort of exercise. And there was a few people who, ex um, who sort of identified purely exercise as the only purpose of their routes. Um, and then, um, you know, you've also got social activities. So meeting up with people or going on a sort of family walk. And then interestingly, um, you've of course got a sort of 20% for dog walking, which I guess um, presents sort of uh, specific characteristics um, specific to, uh, to dog walkers. So we came up with this sort of three, uh, three sort of requirements. So we were looking at methods that could be used to link leisure walking characteristics, data sets to be, uh, that could be used to sort of extrapolate the understanding from our user studies and um, augmenting this data after an initial demonstration. So how can we extend it even further? Uh, so now I'm just going to move on to the to the vision, um, which is sort of an emerging uh, vision and one that we're certainly expecting that will change over the course of the, sort of the project and um, long term uh, research goals. Uh, and once again, it's very specific to our context, but we do think it's uh, quite transferable to other experiential aspects or other sort of um, active travel um, areas. So just to provide a, a high level overview, so we start off with the user study, which is um, forms our sort of grounded theory approach. So we really wanted to base it off of um, you know, what people actually wanted. Um, a lot of research approached the area, sort of looking at sort of computational solutions um, before you know, trying to, uh, to understand the user. Uh, and then we've got sort of the extraction of places of interest from these user studies. Um, then sort of spatial data mining, we were looking to sort of extract those, that information and see how we can extend it across um, sort of our data sources. And then finally looking at sort of characterizing leisure walks um, sort of from these. So I'm going to start off uh, with the user studies. Um, so yeah, so we're using a grounded theory approach and um, we hope to explore sort of the meaningful interactions that occur while leisure walking. So we start off with the project with wanting to look at sort of what mobile interactions sort of implicit, explicit inputs people were using and um, see how we could, you know, capture them and if there was any sort of missing ones. We've later sort of taken that back again and gone through this sort of place of interest approach and seeing how we can capture the interactions that link specifically to the places. Um, so we've just completed a think aloud study. Um, so where a participant is wearing sort of a camera or a GoPro sort of around their sort of, uh, you know, on them. And um, and the sort of the verbal utter utterances of the user are analyzed. So we, we asked people, you know, to think aloud about sort of their walk, what route decisions they made and what sort of, um, you know, areas they were going to, and we asked them to sort of speak aloud and, um, you know, so we could get some rich information about what people sort of thought of an area and um, to get sort of that sort of fuzzy personal placial understanding of it. 
So our analysis, which is which is currently ongoing, will look to merge this sort of these multimodal data sources. So we've got the camera, which we've, um, and then we've also got the um, sort of the, the thinking aloud thoughts, which we've transcribed, and we're also looking to attach these to uh, to GPS, and um, then try and sort of triangulate and understand the purpose and the places of interest of of sort of each walk that we've uh, that took part in the study. So then we move on to sort of extracting sort of the places of interest. Um, so the user study um, provides a really rich set of data. Um, you can imagine sort of even an hour long recording uh, creates incredible amounts of data, especially when you consider sort of the manual transcription due to the sort of amount of noise in the background. And uh, what we've done is we're extracting the places of interest from the walk um, and we're currently analyzing this data and um, looking to extract some more experiential information from the recording. So what are people enjoying? Sort of why are they stopping where they are? And what do they point out and what do they completely ignore and how do they um how do they match what's on the map let's say um so we represent these uh places of interest using a fuzzy spray can tool um, which clusters points around an uncertain location um so you can imagine if someone was talking about you know a specific hill um you can sort of select the whole hill because you're not quite sure what part they're talking about and they're probably just talking about the whole thing if it contributes to the walk then we've got um, sort of the spatial data mining aspect, which is what we're moving into um, sort of once the uh, once this initial analysis is complete. And we hope to use these to uh, sort of extrapolate the data. So how can we first extend sort of the small study area to the entirety of Nottinghamshire and then hopefully to sort of the entirety of Great Britain? Uh, so some initial methods that we're looking at is sort of a real time sort of density based clustering uh, scan for user interactions. I will show a demo of a tool that we're sort of working on for that at the moment. Um, a sort of spatial co-location of known useful features. So if we always pick out sort of certain combinations of, um, of benches and, uh, you know, amenities, let's say, as being quite interesting to, to sort of walkers, then we could try and sort of identify similar areas. View shed analysis for sort of appealing views, but also deciding, you know, whether a route should take someone along, you know, a river, or maybe they should give them a view of the river. Um, a common example I always use is maybe you don't want to actually sort of walk through the castle, but you might want to walk over the hill next to the castle and have a look at it. Uh, then also stop detection. So seeing um, sort of where people are stopping, um, seeing what data exists there and how that can be uh, used to, uh, to sort of help validate the data in a way. So here's um, two example sources that we initially considered. Um, so this is from a website called Geograph. Um, so it tries to map, I think it's every square kilometer of the UK with an with a image of that kilometer. Um, and what we initially tried to do was we were looking at this and thinking maybe we could, you know, uh, try to sort of gain characteristics from this data set. Um, but one of the initial problems we had was sort of um, you would always get sort of perfect characteristics. Um, every single photo from each kilometer would sort of be the, the perfect location of that kilometer square, which made working with the, the data quite difficult. Um, and so what we've moved on to is sort of, you know, trying to capture those user interactions and um, match them against sort of more, I guess, traditional data sets such as POIs and, um, you know, view shared analysis and uh, sort of height maps and things like that. So here's a here's an example of a piece of software that we, we're working on, um, which is built to provide sort of an explicit input um, into the into the software. So it's referred to at the moment as Walkways. So I'm sure everybody's used sort of the mobile application or has at least heard of Waze. Um, which people can sort of explicitly report, you know, traffic jams and things like that. So our idea here is is to try and capture some, you know, real time data and sort of the real sort of um, real time data on what's changing about sort of specific leisure walks um, within a study area, of course. So now we move on to sort of our sort of vision for characterizing these. Um, so each walk is very individual to a user, um, sort of different interest decisions and experiences for each sort of walk instance. Um, so it presents an interesting challenge in regards to characterizing walks with different experiential factors needing to be represented. And uh, these complexities could require sort of a more subjective and personal approach. Um, so for example, POIs are quite well understood and often reference specific functions and locations, um, but they don't really rep represent any user experiences. Um, so what we're trying to do is add in those experiences um, to a sort of this fuzzy model. And what we have here is uh, the two approaches that we've initially looked at. Um, so our first uh, sort of attempts used sort of route characterization. Um, so characterizing GPS traces and providing routes based upon existing traces or predefined routes. So this really didn't work very well and it, um, it created a long amount of sort of uh, analysis and computation time. 
So what we've moved to now is sort of grid characterization. Um, so characterizing uh, grid cells. So our current um, work is working alongside sort of the Uber H3 grid and um, trying to work with it at sort of quite a sort of in-depth scale and um, seeing how we can generate dynamic routes and characterize existing GPS traces because fortunately that would allow us to, to perform both. Just a couple of considerations. So tourism systems uh, can use POIs and services to Foursquare. So they've got quite a lot of data, whereas the problems with this is sort of the subjective and the scalability of this data. Um, and subjective data can be quite difficult to scale, especially in sort of more rural areas where not as many people visit. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I'll, I'll just move on to the uh, sort of the future work section because it covers both. Um, so our work will continue to investigate these potential characteristics of the route and how these can be stored effectively. So we're still looking at this sort of H3 grid and seeing how we can um, sort of map additional attributes um, to each grid cell um, and seeing how we can, um, you know, then map them to specific user requirements of the walk. And then we're hoping to use the analysis of the Think Aloud study to provide a grounded theory approach to curating the characteristics of leisure walking routes and um, hopefully ending up with a design for a framework for recommending leisure walking experiences. And um, yeah, I think that's about 15 minutes. So um, that's, the, uh, that's the presentation. Great, thank you very much, James. It occurred to me how much I could use your research as I've been walking around for fun after just arriving here in Vienna. So um, I see quite a few questions in the Q&A tab and I'm gonna just dive right in and, uh, and start showing some questions. So first question is to Killian. In the context of the geoparsing pipeline, can you talk a bit more about how you handle ambiguous place names? How do you map the place names that can correspond to multiple locations within the gazetteer? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the idea is what we used was contextual place names for each ambiguous place name. So uh, the problem is if you just use a comment as a context, there's rarely going to be more than say two or three place names mentioned in a single comment. So what we ended up doing was um, find each time a, a certain place name was mentioned in the whole subreddit and then found every related uh, place name in each comment that mentions it. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but <laughs> Essentially, we find the distance from each contextual place name with reference to the ambiguous place name, and then the shortest um, combined distance com with re respect to all these contextual place names gives us the uh, the place name we're trying to find. Um, if if you so at the end of my slides, my GitHub repository is on there, and you can probably just look at the the, the methodology there. It's 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 reasonably hard to explain, but essentially we use we use context uh, contextual place names based on the subreddit. All right, thank you for that, that answer and that question. Um, I'm gonna move on and, and spread the questions around. So I'd like to bring up a question for Tyler. This is one of two. Uh, so super interesting presentation. I work in spatial epidemiology where we model the built environment around individuals. Now I realize this is a tricky question, but how would you suggest combining spatial causal inference with more traditional statistical methods for causal inference that control for individual factors? Would you also control for spatial factors? Uh, yeah, actually, that's exactly how you do it. So, so there are a lot of methods out there for controlling for spatial confounders. And in fact, epidemiology is, is at the forefront of this uh, developing them. Um, so there are, there are case control matching methods, um, neighborhood adjustments, uh, you could use star models. Uh, ma many non-spatial causal methods have a way to adjust for it using some kind of latent variable to uh, encode space or by the lags of the variables. And I mean, as you know, uh, causal inference, it, a lot of causal inference is about setting up the right assumptions so that if we observe associations between treatment and outcome, we can give it a causal interpretation. So as a result, we can use a lot of existing methods and a lot of these sort of existing spatial methods uh, for estimation, as long as we properly set up the assumptions that concern space beforehand. And so that's part of the, the theory development side that we need to do is, is make sure that we've got these established properly and that we've vetted all the possible ways that space could uh, come into play in causal relationships. Okay, thank you, Tyler, uh, for that answer. And thank you for the question. Um, now I'd like to move to a question for James. James, you said that POI are well understood. Intuitively, I would argue otherwise. We are not even able to align their categories and tags. Can you comment on what you meant? Um, yeah, so I guess I would 
<laughs> when you say it like this, yes, I completely agree um, that POIs are, you know, um, from different data sources, especially, um, can often represent sort of different things. Um, I guess I meant it in the way of sort of the, the model of a POI being sort of a point on a map, uh, as opposed to the sort of fuzzy sort of place sort of concept that we were looking at, um, as opposed to, um, you know, sort of POIs are, you know, well understood in research, if that makes sense. All right, thanks for explaining that, James. Let's see, let's go back to a question um, for Killian, I believe. How do you measure toponym resolution for performance with respect to street names? Street geometry is usually represented as polyline, so I'm curious about it. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, so I guess this is really a limitation of gazetteers because typically all they give you is, is, is a single point. Um, and you mentioned streets, but if you think about something like a city, it's not a single point either, right? So it's it's something we basically just just ignore because you sort of make this assumption that well, um, it's like a generalized uh, representation of a place. <clears throat> but I think it's a very good point, and the answer is we don't really measure it because <laughs> if we were, you know, any city would span a much larger area than um, than they do on a, in a, in a natural gazetteer as well. All right, thank you for that question and that answer. Um, let me bring up another question for Tyler. How would you account for the importance of time? For example, questions about temporal autocorrelation, lag effects, et cetera, in developing theories about spatial causality inference? Yeah, so the, the arrow of time, right, is where cause flows, sort of. So you can only it, it, antecedent, antecedence is an, a widely accepted prerequisite for cause, right? You have to have something has to happen first and then a result has to happen afterwards in order to, for you to establish a cause. And um, in many spatial scenarios, we work with uh, longitudinal data, things that happen simultaneously all at once. Um, and so we temporal effects are absolutely important. And if we have temporal data as well, then there are more powerful methods that we can use because it fleshes out that arrow of time that we're able to then uh, do inference on. Uh, without it, we can still do, uh, we can still do inference, assuming that that arrow is sort of squashed into the simultaneous data set that we're already looking at. Um, and those are sort of well established uh, methods. Thank you, Tyler, and thank you, Silong, for the question. Um, let's see, let's go to another question for Killian. Do you have any idea uh, to handle and geoparse non-named entities that refer to a location, for example, the bakery close to Central Park? Yeah, again, this is a, I really like this question. Um, <laughs> so I have looked at this in the past. So the, the, the issue with something like this is you're, you don't generally treat something like the bakery as an entity in, in something like named entity recognition. Um, so the idea that I've had in the past of, of trying to sort of geolocate something like this would be to use uh, what's called spatial uh, role, no, spatial role labeling or, or uh, relationship sort of classification where you could actually identify there being a relationship between the, the bakery and Central Park. And then if you're able to um, quantify what close to means, then you can give it a different kind of relationship. Um, but from what I've tried to do, uh, it, it didn't really work very well. So <laughs> I'm sure there's ways of doing it well, but I, there's no existing research that does that specifically that I know of. Okay, thank you. And while you're there, um, I'll pull up another question for you. Can you talk more about the H3 part? Yeah, so, so the idea with, um, it's a shame I didn't go into too much detail, but essentially uh, it was an alternative way of visualizing the PCI connectivities. So you can, you can visualize them as these um, sort of uh, two-way connections. But if you subset by, say, London, you can look at where London connects to every other location in the UK. And on top of that, what we decided to do was to use H3 as this uniform uh, sort of tessellation of polygons rather than these varying local authority districts uh, in an attempt to sort of uh, mitigate against the modifiable aerial unit problem. Um, and I think personally, I, I find it easier to interpret when we use H3 alongside this subset of, of cities as well. <laughs> 
Yes. So H3 is overlapping why S2 isn't. Why not pick S2 but H3? Um, I, I'm not familiar with S2, to be honest. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely have a look at it now that you've mentioned Super. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thanks. We just took advantage of the fact that there are several people sitting around me in this room here in Vienna. And uh, I think now we've, we've answered all the questions that are in the chat. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers, James Williams, Tyler Hoffman, and Killian Berrigan, um, for preparing your, your talks and your papers today. And uh, if anyone, if the speakers have time and are not going straight to bed, for example, um, we invite you to join the Q&A table in the social lounge right after this session. But the next session starting in just over 15 minutes will be an early career panel, and we hope you can join us for that. So thank you for joining us here and uh, see you later. <laughs>